Hello, how's it going? Welcome to this very special episode, I guess. I've been trying to do this for a while, this topic, but I just, the simulation wasn't working. But I found a solution to this problem, which is pretty ingenious, I think. So some of the classic techniques to simulate soft bodies, you know, boobs and, and breasts and things, are to use sort of a, a lattice of points where every point interacts with its neighbors. And this is basically finite element or finite difference method. So you have a bunch of rules such as Hooke's law and things, and you basically run your physics simulation. And I thought about this, but I thought, wouldn't it be much easier to sort of simulate a point, like a control point, and then model the rest of the transformation according to that point. So let's say, for instance, that we have a simple, like, two-body situation, and we are tracking the forces, sort of, we fix one end point, and then we let the other end point sort of swing freely. We track the forces on that, and then we use that position of that end point to apply some sort of transformation to a semicircle of points. That's pretty bad. But the transformation that I'm applying is a shear transformation. So if we have our original shape like this, just set the origin right here, then the way a shear transform works is one variable is affected by the other variable. This is a non-affine transform. So let's say, for instance, that I want to shear everything downwards. So what I do is I'd say the Y coordinate under transformation is the original Y coordinate plus something times the X coordinate. So then these points here are unaffected, but then the more we travel outwards, something like this, the more we travel outwards, the more that transformation is applied. So that's the basic idea. Also, if we were to apply a shear transformation to a semicircle, we would get something that looks a little bit like this. So it sort of looks like a semicircle like that, but uh, this is reasonable. But what I really want is some sort of nice curvature like that, right? I mean, comes down to preference, I guess, but this looks a little more realistic, I believe. So what we can do there is when we're generating our semicircle, we can apply one rule to the upper side of the semicircle and another rule to the bottom side. So here we're going from an angle of pi down to negative pi on two. So what we can do is down here, We'll have a semicircle, so we'll have um, x equals some radius times cosine theta, y again is some radius times sine theta, and then over here, what I've got is I've got my if I were to say x equals some radius times cosine theta, then when x is two pi, cos of two pi, sorry pi on two, is zero and then cos of zero is one. So I've got some function which varies from zero to one, but I just want to change the concavity of it. And it turns out that we can accomplish this by taking cosine just to any power. So for instance, for illustration, if we were to take cosine squared, we're still varying from zero to one, but when the numbers are closer to zero, they sort of stay flatter for longer and then we still get that, um, that shape that we want. So any power you want, I found that cosine cubed gave the most natural shape. If I went any higher, it started to look sort of boxy, not just here, but around this point as well, started to look a little more discontinuous. And we can simply go y equals r sine theta. Okay, so far so good. So here we've generated an initial sort of set of points 
the situation now is we're going to update our control point according to some physics simulation and then based on that so based on that we're then going to apply some sort of shear transformation okay so far so good but then the next question is how do we sort of apply the simulation part this may seem straightforward but either i've overcomplicated it or misunderstood the physics or something but um here we go so let's say we have some point one end is fixed the other end is free to move and there's a number of forces sort of applied here let's say that we've got gravity gravity is just pulling straight down this is going to decompose into two sorts of forces this is going to decompose into an angular force which will result in a sort of rotation and it will decompose into a whoops a linear force like a, a push and pull on the string itself i'll just go ahead and call this direction vector the axis okay and i call this one a for angular l for linear or something it really doesn't matter so the way i perform this vector decomposition is that we know that the angular force is going to be perpendicular to the axis and if you have any experience with vectors and things we have basically that the angular force will be put f for force this is the incoming force if we take the force and the cross product with the axis the result here will be something which is acting perpendicularly and the magnitude of that will be the amount of angular force imparted on that um, point and then similarly we know that the linear force the linear component of the motion is parallel with the axis and so the way to get the way to measure how parallel a vector is with another vector is to take the dot product between them so if i take the force dot product with the axis the magnitude well it is a magnitude right it's a number but the number indicates sort of how many newtons of push or pull are occurring at this point now this is really important because i want this point not just to swing around but to also be able to jiggle is that the word anyway i want it to have a bit of push and pull be a little bit elastic so the the concept of angular force is pretty straightforward we have some sort of um, angular acceleration so acceleration angular we calculate that by taking the sum of all the angular forces so for every force that's acting on this object we decompose it find the angular components sum those all together and then we get the velocity will be our time step times our acceleration well it ah, doing a bad job of explaining this but at every time step we add on at every frame we add on our time step times our acceleration that gives us our amount of velocity our change in velocity and then we have our angle at every time step again will be delta time times our angular velocity and we can check various things so for instance i've set up sort of a hard limit so that if we get within some certain angle we'll simply rebound and this makes the uh the breast um just sort of bounce a little bit and likewise we have the same situation for linear motion but the linear motion is going to be da -da -da -da, pretty much the same but we will just be affecting the radius and so what i'm doing is i'm actually doing all my calculations in polar coordinates and then 
uh, at the end, after I've calculated the new angle and the new radius, then I recompose that into the XY position of the control point. This possibly is one of my most ranty videos. I don't know, I don't normally do this topic, but I thought it was fun, so why not? So what do we have in, in terms of forces? Well, we have gravity. That's a constant force that's always acting. We have motion. So if the character were to do, 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 walk along, the they wouldn't be continuously jiggling because you only change your motion when you're accelerating or you know, when you're changing velocity. And so there's a concept called impulse. So when we suddenly go from rest to constant motion, a short, sharp, force is imparted in order to achieve that. That's called an impulse. The way I'm approximating this is at every time step, I'm sort of remembering the velocity which was used in the last update. And then I'm comparing that with the velocity in the current update to get the instantaneous change in velocity. And then I'm applying that as a force. Oh yeah, is elastic force. So the concept of elastic force is that the force due to an elastic object is some, so let's say our spring has some sort of natural length. And if we are at that length, that is the, the good and natural length, and there's going to be no push or pull on the object. But if we were to stretch beyond that length or to be short of that length, then there's a restorative force, which acts in the direction of the string. And so we have an additional force provided by stretching. Anyway, so I've probably butchered this explanation, but I'm going to get the camera out of the way and onto the fun stuff, right? I mean, this is what we came for. Code is linked down below. As always, you're welcome to jump in and take a look at it, but it's really simple, nothing too fancy. I'll just fire it up, have a look at it. So here we've got our body that we're simulating. The green dots here are just for reference. And what we can do is we can hit an arrow key to start moving. So when I hit the key, it's very subtle, but we start moving an impulse is applied. And then when we stop moving, we see there's a little bit of, yeah, jiggle. And what I was going for here was a more natural effect. We can also go up and we can actually, if you pay attention to this control point here, we can see the elastic motion coming in there and we can just continually like move around just to really make it more obvious but yeah this is a very hopefully it's a very subtle effect but we can always tune it a little bit so i'll make it a bit more extreme for now so if i were to go in and change the spring constant let me change the rigidity so the rigidity controls the angular rebound. So get this going. And you can see that actually we have quite a lot of, uh, of rebound there. And we can actually now get some really extreme angles. Start breathing heavy into the mic. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we've got that, but we've also got like if you were to jump down in here, this is a little bit of a mess. Here we go. So I'm also applying some spring damping and this is simply stopping the spring from bouncing forever. We can remove the spring damping and then you see we get into positions where the spring will just indefinitely bounce like this. How many of us have played a game with this? Like if you play Stellar Blade and you put the graphics up to maximum and you look at your character portrait, they're doing this. Their tie is uh, bouncing around like this. So this is really not great. I don't know, maybe you're into this. It's not for me. But yeah, there we have it. So that was just a little run through of... Yeah, we can leave that there. That was just a little run through of my um, simulation that I coded up today because I was bored and I am considering adding this to one of my projects. Yeah, I can't think of a way to end this. So thank you for watching. I hope you had fun and I will see you again soon.
Bye.